Okay, let's find this. Great, let's um, find this. Let's find the screen share button. Um, everyone, hang on, Beverly. Let me just say hello to everybody arriving. Oh yes, and start in the right way. Good. Right. Okay. Well, this is our one hundred and fifty first Black History Conversations, and I'm here in Bantock Park, Wolverhampton. So we're kind of taking uh, Black History Conversations on the road. We'll be travelling quite a bit over the next. Uh, next few sessions. But I'm delighted that we've got Beverly here with us today. It's absolutely wonderful. And Beverly's going to um, introduce herself and she's going to tell us about the black presence in the Northeast. We've got several others joining us as well. See somebody else there who that is in the car. All right, no, it's you, June Elizabeth. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, I think we usually start with a with respect to, to the ancestors, respect to the history, and recognize that there's still so much to do. And I just had the pleasure um, with my hands free um, as I was driving here to hear the conversation that went on before this session. And Audrey, I'm really delighted that you've joined us as well. This is lovely. Um, so this will be a bit of an in and out session. Some of us can stay right through, some of us can't. But we're going to record your session, Beverly, so we can all listen to it. And I think we need to learn a lesson from this. Running Black History Conversations in Black History Month is a bit difficult because everybody's got so many other things on, so it just makes it a, a real challenge. Anyway, we're absolutely delighted that you're joining us. And uh, you've got all your screen sharing sorted out. And uh, thanks, Simon, for doing that for us. And um, I'm just going to uh, listen while I have a cup of coffee. In the <laughs> but I'm going to switch my uh, picture off and I'm going to switch my sound off. So over to you then, Beverly. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. OK, thanks a lot. OK, so just to say how honoured I am to be here, how happy I am and to just hope this will all work. Um, so I don't think I want to spend much time introducing myself. I think it's, you know, our time is so important. So I am a community historian, an activist. I have a history background. I think that's all I want to say before I start. So the important thing for me is to thank you and to appreciate your being here, appreciate the people who will take the time to listen to this recording. So I've put it as African Lives in Northeast England and Black History Month. Well, of course, we all would agree that Black History shouldn't just be in one month. And in fact, that it's not Black History. It's world history, it's local history, it's British history, it's European history, it's international history. So it's a very sort of contested phrase, Black History Month. But if I if I move into the options, um, we started this African Lives in Northern England project in 2020 during COVID. The idea was to do a calendar to try and show a different view of Africans, of people of African descent, um, to counteract the racism in Newcastle. Just one small attempt to reduce the racism. So from one calendar grew three calendars. From the calendars grew a, a project with Historic England doing school resources, which covered the whole of the Northern Northeast, Northern England and Cumbria. We then did a booklet, which is for sale, five pounds plus postage. Um, and then we went to walks because we thought not everybody's method of learning is necessarily via print. So we went to walks as a more interactive method. Our rationale for doing all of this was to highlight the resilience and contributions of people of African descent, to challenge racism, and that we not guess interlopers or burden, but builders, and to challenge pity. We are not enslaved victims. Um, it was about historical accuracy, closer to the truth, and to increase a sense of pride and belonging. And also, which is what this, many of the students pointed out, it's how do we learn for the present? 
It's about anti-racism, resilience, aiming high and working together. So that was the theme through all the publications. So then we did, so now we into the, into the walks. And I've done it in several different ways. One of them was about discovering, the process of discovering this information, which was very, very interesting, very serendipitous, very lucky, very dependent on goodwill. And that's an, a lovely story and another story. We've done something about the hidden depths, how each building is more than we think, each person is more than we think. And that's, again, another story. I thought beginning this, I would just do a little bit on the walk, just a part of the walk, the virtual walk, and I would do the lesser known people rather than the, the more popular, the more well-known people. So I will now move to the website. So I'll stop sharing for a minute and hopefully get onto the website. And in showing you the website, I want it to be something that everybody can, can use, can feel comfortable that they can get on easily themselves. So I'll just stop share for a minute and see if I can get the website up. You never know. Um, so I'll share. Is the website on? Yes. So this is this is the website and welcome to African Lives in Northern England. Um, we're having something tomorrow. We've got a plaque that we've put up. We have loads of different um, information on the website. All our calendars are on here, even the booklet, but I still want you to buy one um, and the walk. So you just go to the walks on the, in the, on the website. And there's two walks, Central Walk and North Newcastle Walk. And we're going to the North Newcastle Walk. On the website and before every walk, we have a little introduction and we try and talk about the language we use. We talk about enslaved, not slave, to show it was a deliberate action done to people. We talk about why we say of African descent, because we use black and black is used for the wider constituency that is vulnerable and fights racism. So we are very specific. Um, we talk about racism and the re reality of racism a little bit and then go into the walk. So we're going to the North Newcastle walk now. It's actually North Central Newcastle. They're both in the center of Newcastle. And while the, um, while the booklet, the school resources are all of the Northeast, not Newcastle centric at all, the walk, because most of the records and most of the visitors are from Newcastle and the biggest population, that's what we focused on. But the resources are much wider than Newcastle. Uh, let's see if I can show you. So this is the walk. So we move from one, which is Paul Robeson. And we're not going to, I'm not going to talk about him, though there's a lot of lovely stuff about him, including his singing. We then move to West Indies House. House, which I will talk about, early African exhibitions. There's then Martin Luther King, which I whom I won't talk about. A lot of stuff in, on the walk, including his speech. Early African doctors, I will talk about. Colonial students. And I won't talk about Frederick Douglass, partly because he's already so well known. So I'm focusing on perhaps the lesser known and perhaps in some ways the more challenging stories. So I am, we're going to start with point two, West Indies House. Now there's always a little thing about it. And we're going to look at three, four different things, the house itself and four different kind of groups. We look at in Labi, the um, superintendent, Mike Kalyani, one of the sailors and the British Honduran forestry workers. Um, on the walk itself, there's loads and loads of pictures. Um, and we also have a booklet with pictures that we show people on the walk. But this gives you some idea of the pictures. We show where this West Indies house was. 
and where it is now, in a sense, under the ruins, the found under the foundations of our city um, civic center. So we show that we have this picture of West Indies House and the poster that was circulated all around the Caribbean to encourage sailors to come to this hub. And we have Labi Olabi, who was the superintendent. So it's full of pictures, it's full of recordings, it's full of songs for Paul, for Paul Robeson. Then to find out more, you go to the tab at the top, West Indies House. So we have the picture as it was, a beautiful terrace pulled down for the Civic Center. It was three houses, it housed about 60 people. Um, it started off as a, a kind of DOS house by the British Sailor Society and was taken over by the colonial office as it was in meant to be a hub for West Indian sailors. Um, it never really took off as that, but it did house West Indian sailors. Um, and then Olabi. Olabi was a student, a student of law in Newcastle. He was the first person appointed in a super supervising role for the British Sailors Association and by the colonial and the colonial office. He managed it very, very efficiently, and we'll have a recording about that. What's interesting, I think, is he was important in Newcastle for his role in West Indies House, but he was also important in the Pan-African Congress, that important Congress in terms of the liberation of Af Africa, perhaps not totally liberated yet, but in terms of that movement, in terms of the working of African people and West Indian activists, and he was part of that. He was part of a defense committee in London to protect African people, people of African descent against racists and against the police. He was also, um, he was a, a lawyer, a barrister. He, he went to Ghana and he was a high court judge, a law justice in Ghana. So you're looking at this diasporic influence that has its role in Newcastle, perhaps its start in Newcastle, but is so important worldwide. Um, so that's Olabi, we'll hear a little bit more about him. Um, and then Michael Yanni, um, he was a teacher in Sierra Leone and he decided to, he, he answered the call to join the empire in fighting in World War II. He came to England on a ship, SSS Cuba, that was built in the Northeast and he landed at Liverpool. What's interesting about Michael Yanni, not just that he represents the sailors who stayed at West Indies House, you can see a picture of them eating here, but that he gave two very different reports of his treatment. So the one report he gave to Dunbar, a Guyanese journalist, talks about the horrific treatment the Africans suffered on this French-owned boat and how badly they were treated by the, I suppose, the DHS equivalent when they landed in Liverpool. When he spoke as a representative of the colonial office or in a broadcast by the colonial office, he spoke about a wonderful treatment he had on board, that the president's wife visited them and they had everything was wonderful. Um, and it's just interesting that in the same year, the same person gave these two very different stories with different agendas to different audiences. So that's always something we like to draw out, the limitations of any story, the written word as well as the verbal. Uh, he spoke very highly of West Indies House in both stories. So we feel that's, you know, pretty reliable. So that's the sailors who were a big part of West Indies House. And there was the British forestry workers, not well known, 840 came um, from British Honduras, and they worked largely in Scotland, um, but in fact, only in Scotland. They were treated extremely badly, very different to the workers from Northumberland or Canada, Australia, who were treated as um, military people, war people, and given that kind of salary compared to who, how the British Hondurans, who were begged to come over to support the war effort in felling timber, 
how they were treated. They were cold, badly resourced, badly housed, poor medical treatment, their clothing weren't fitting, some absconded, many came to the big cities for rest and recreation, including to Newcastle, where they stayed at West Indies House. And then when they were demobbed, usually against their wishes, just before the end of the war, they were told, go back. Some were able to stay and stayed in Newcastle for quite a long time and put down roots in this part of the world. So if we move through the Honduran workers, 840, quite a substantial number. And then again, on the walk, we have recordings online and so, and we do this on the walk. We've got a quite a good um, system now for uh, audio. Um, and this is just a broadcast, but I'll let it speak Report for itself. by Rodolf Dunbar, 1942, to Sir Donald Cameron of Colonial Office. Social welfare among the colored people on the Tyne side. West Indies House at Newcastle upon Tyne is decisively impressive. It was opened two months ago by the colonial office, which had been appealed to by the West Indian government to provide adequate accommodation for colored seamen when on shore. The warden of the hospital, Mr. Labby, is a London University graduate from Nigeria. He is efficient and businesslike as one would expect from a student of economics. The hostel has been designed to give the occupants the greatest possible living space and comfort. At meal times, all the high flavored gastronomic delicacies which form an essential part of the Creole cuisine are to be found on the tables in the dining room. When it was opened, West Indies House aroused envy of some of the local inhabitants who pointed out that not even the white seamen had such comfortable accommodation. Mr. Bullitt, the regional welfare seamen's officer and the colonial office pointed out that essential hospitality should be accorded to colored seamen living far from the homes in the rigorous English climate. As a result, West Indies House stands a fitting monument to the interest of the colonial office in its colored African subjects. The excessively cleanly condition in which the establishment is kept and the warm hospitality extended to white visitors have won many friends for the African people in Newcastle. Mr. Labby and his lodgers are doing useful work for they are making contact with people who had no real knowledge of the British Empire. Um. So, as you can hear, it was a showpiece a bit for the colonial office, and they used it to get people to come and encourage people from Africa of African descent to, uh, to appreciate Britain, to think positively of Britain, and to contribute to the war effort. It was also, I think, an important mixing ground because you would have the sailors, the forestry workers, you would have um, the committees with students, with professionals, with doctors. Um, the people who would talk, come and talk, would be from a wider range of professions. So you had it as a kind of a mixing house for people of African descent, which I think is important. After we leave there, we then walk across the main road towards Newcastle University. That would be um, points three and four on the map. And we move to early African exhibitions at um, the Hatton Gallery. Now, if you look at the bottom, there's Google Docs, which tell you more about the residence and about the house. But we're not going to go there today because um, I've included most of it. So in the Hatton Gallery, 
there's an, there was the exhibition in 1943 that was important. Um, it was attended by Fela Soande, who was called the father of Nigerian art music. Um, people came up from London, from SOAS, um, from Wasu, Solanke, the Secretary General of the West African Student Union. It was an important exhibition. What was interesting was that it was put on, not in a sense by the gallery, but by Newcastle International Club and the Society for the Cultural Advancement of Africa. Now you're looking at clubs of Africans existing and flourishing as early as the 1940s, which I think is important. And this society was started to build together as a race conscious unit, Africans, Caribbeans, and African Americans. So it was an interesting society that kept close links with West Africa, to which many of the people returned. But this, I felt, my impression is that this exhibition was launched almost to take the taste out of people's mouths, to counteract the kind of racist exhibition that had happened about 13 years earlier. And that was in 1929 at the Tong Mo in Newcastle. The Tong Mo is as big as is bigger than Hyde Park and a couple of the parks in London. It's as big as Central Park in New York. At the Tong Mo, they had the great Northeast Coast exhibition in 1929. Now, this was an amazing exhibition. Over five months, four million people attended. And if you think of the, you know, the population of Britain at that time, um, it had, you know, concerts, it had its own post office, it had a, a huge building um, for arts, another huge pa a palace of the arts, another huge building, palace of science and industry. It was to showcase the Northeast and to bring investment into the Northeast. It didn't succeed because it was closely followed by the um, Great Recession. But that was what it was. And what's, I think, of interest is um, they had in it an ex an African village. And they spoke about, and there is a fine collection of wild animals from distant lands. And in this, within this, there is the African village where a hundred natives of West Africa, it actually wasn't a hundred, um, they are very positive about some people. Chief Thian, a man of culture and strength of character, but patronizing. There is music, not perhaps a chamber concert standard, but music nevertheless. And then you have these kinds of descriptions. These people are practically savages. And then they go on primitive, as is the form of life seen in the African village. Visitors to the amusement park have the opportunity of going even a step lower. They may see the very dawn of life in the huge chicken incubator, which, of course, was just next to the African village. But in a, while we have this instance of massive racism, which is never acknowledged in the Northeast in the publicity, publicity about the Northeast Coast exhibition. We also have this evidence of anti-racism, of resilience, of friendship across borders. Um, and I will demonstrate that in this reading from the human Zulu, Zulu, in An Innocent in Britain by Robert Wesley Cole. That summer, an international North East Coast exhibition was held at the vast Newcastle Town Mall. It was well supported by the business community of the Northeast. Among the site attraction proposed and advertised months in advance was an African village. I was shocked at the idea. Docketry, Coy, and I wrote vainly to the local papers against the idea. The thought of displaying these people in a zoological sideshow in this strange cold country to be an object of ridicule and entertainment was objectionable. Fortunately, there was in existence a union of West African students 
of Great Britain and Ireland, which had been formed a few years earlier and was under the active management of Mr. Ladipo Solanke, a Nigerian barrister, ex for a base student. He had remained in England, where in London he carried on his work and interest on behalf of Africa. He took up the matter urgently, and the idea of getting such people from British Africa was scrapped, thanks to help from sympathetic members of parliament. Nevertheless, the promoters got round the ban and brought in light-skinned Moroccans from French-speaking North Africa, who were doubtly in disadvantage over the language problem, with either their own language nor the French being available to them. What, in a sense, so as well as drawing sort of the friendship, the resilience, the anti-racism, what's interesting is the kind of links so Wellesley Cole, who was, had only been in Newcastle for about a year, was one of the big challengers, and he was one of the people who started the society which sponsored the exhibition of the Hatton Gallery. So Lanke fought against this human zoo, and he also came up to that exhibition in Hatton Gallery. So what you're looking at is not only noteworthy individuals, what you are looking at is a community that works together. I think that is something we forget at our peril, the importance of the community working together. Now, on the walk, just a step away from the Hatton Gallery is the statue to Martin Luther King. And we talk up, we get, um, show his speech on the walk, etc. Pov against poverty, racism and war. But we won't go there now because of, you know, our time and you already know about Martin Luther King. Um, we're going to go across the university through the Armstrong building, through King's Hall to the Royal Victoria Infirmary. Now, uh, that walk is interesting because the peop the doc African doctors we will speak about at the Royal Victoria Infirmary, they came often via Fourier Bay College in Sierra Leone, which was part of Durham University. And they came to Durham University and to the medical school at Newcastle. And they would walk through, um, they would work and walk through Armstrong Building and King's Hall and then practice and work at the RVI. So we are following in their footsteps, going through Armstrong Building, through King's Hall, talking about Martin Luther King, and then to the Royal Victoria Infirmary. So we'll go to the tab for the Royal Victoria Infirmary. Um, so the first person we'll speak of, on the walk, there are four doctors. We often speak of maybe two or three. I'll talk about three rather than all four. So one of the people I want to speak about is Dr. Irene Cole. She was the first Sierra Leonean woman to qualify as a doctor and the second person of African descent to qualify as a, as a doctor. Um, she assisted in the war effort. She specialized in um, gynecology. She worked at her brother's practice. Again, you're looking at Ling. She was one of the few women who spoke at um, the meetings of, not at the meetings, at the conferences at that level on a West African Student Union. She wrote a paper for them talking about education and healthcare and women's rights. She was eventually awarded an MBE, and we have um, a tra uh, recording of a son speaking about her. I won't play the recording now. What he speaks about, uh, but on the walk and on the website, it's there. What he speaks about is her commitment to people, to everybody, regardless of their ethnicity, gender, etc., but also her commitment to women succeeding. Um, she was a feminist when she went back to Nigeria. Her husband was a barrister who she met in Newcastle. He was studying law and she went back to Nigeria, his home country, where he was a successful barrister. And when she heard she couldn't vote because she, as a woman, she didn't have to pay taxes, she paid taxes so she could vote. Um, when her son speaks, he speaks about her, one of her greatest achievements 
was setting up, and this was within three years, building staff and everything, the teaching hospital of Benin. She did this in three years, and she was, as a, the first chair of the board, one of the highest policy-making decisions in Nigeria, the first woman to have that kind of position in Nigeria. And a lovely phrase her son wrote, which I feel is, is so relevant today, is that she managed to get this teaching hospital running against bureaucratic obstruction, male egos, political sabotage, and vested interests. And I think, you know, we all know about these things. So she is really very, very outstanding, and yet very little known, though we are trying to get a plaque for her. I'm not going to mention one of them, but I'm going to mention briefly Ishmael Cummings. Not a lot. He also was at Fouri Bay College. There's a picture here. Um, I think for me, the interesting thing, he was here in 1914. So that was a good decade before Wellesley Cole, and that was a long time before the Windrush. So we are looking at this long history of people of African descent in the Northeast, as in the rest of England. And we are looking, he worked at Burnup Field as well as at the RVI. Now, Burnup Field is a little mining village in uh, County Durham, not very well known. I hadn't even heard of it. So what we're looking at, and this is, we see from um, Wellesley Cole's records, is his book, you had Afri doctors of African descent embedded in these tiny places, doing great jobs and being well-respected, Dr. Cherry doing, you know, going over and above in these tiny mining villages. And that for me is really worth, you know, bringing to the fore. Um, he had a son over here, Ivor Cummings, and we'll talk about him later. Again, you may have heard of Ivor Cummings too. Um, but here as well in the RVI, we have Robert Wellesley Cole. Um, he was the first African fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. He fought massively against racism. When they said, well, we're not giving you this job, the people might like it. He said, it's not the people I have a problem with. It's the medical profession that is keeping the bars up. He was instrumental in bringing a lot of nurses and doctors from Sierra Leone to access training. It's called The Black Doctor. Um, and I'll just play a tiny bit of his, the talk by his, a recording by his daughter, um, which talks about, you know, how he, he was in all these colonial office committees. He tried, again, he, um, he wanted to fight in the war, but like, if you remember Yanni, but because as a doctor, he would be in an officer role, that was never allowed. His, you know, his, um, what was it? His applications were never, ever followed up. Um, he, yet he was on all these committees and he struggled very hard to ensure that education in West Africa wasn't rolled back. When they started the University of the West Indies, they wanted to forget about African education. And he fought to say, no, 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 we must move Africa into university education as well. Um, I'll just play, play a little bit of his daughter's speech. Um, yep, it's very important. I don't overdo because our time is precious. So I am going to a particular point here. He'd like to be remembered for helping others and or to achieve their aims and dreams through his committee work and as a professional. On colonial office committees, he ensured educational standards for Africans didn't go down. An activist, he fought against racial prejudice and discrimination, succeeding the great Dr. Harold Moody as president of the League of Coloured People. 
almost forgotten, mm -hmm. aged 15 in 1922, he came second in the empire in the number of distinctions in the Cambridge School Certificate, graduating with first class when he was head boy at the Sierra Leone Grammar School in Freetown. His legacy? He was the first black African to become an FRCS, Fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, in 1946. In 1960, Cambridge University Press published his best-selling childhood autobiography, Cossetown Boy, which became a textbook in African schools. The historian Christopher Fife wrote his Times obituary on the 2nd of December, 1995, describing him as, and I quote, in a modest way, and was in figurehead for his people, a fitting tribute for such an inspirational trailblazer who happened to be my father. Some, something else interesting about him, I think, in terms of his fight against racism, not just against the medical profession. In 1962, when he went in a colonial office position as a senior doctor in West Africa, his passport was withdrawn and he could not return to Britain. So when we think the Windrush scandal is something new, no, we have to look at its roots and its history. He was denied entry to Britain in exactly the same kind of way in 1962. And he was an Anglophile. He loved England. He found it extremely hard to take what he called was sadistic behavior. And now we move in to the very last one to the Colonial Student Club. On the walk, it isn't the last one, but I think, you know, that's sufficient. You'll have to come on the walk in Newcastle or you'll have to also look at it online. So Colonial Student Club, another lovely building, which is, unlike the West Indies one, the building is still standing. It's now used mainly by students and professionals. It was used where the students would gather to formulate proposals. Now in um, uh, Oyenuga's biography, they speak about how the people in Africa did not like Blacks and they could with difficulty find any accommodation. So this Colonial Students Club was where they were housed and where they could stay when the university was closed over the long summer holidays. Um, they also found that the churches in Newcastle didn't like Black people either. And it was actually very hard for them to find that, to find a a church to worship. Ivor Cummings, who I mentioned, Ishmael's coming son, um, he applied to join the British Army, but was refused uh, because he wasn't, as the phrase they used, he wasn't of pure European descent. He became um, one of the first black people or people of African descent to become a member of the colonial office, an officer of the colonial office. He worked with one of the... Um, the colonial office houses in London, and he supported African and people of African descent sailors, etc. In London, um, he also then he came up to he worked in the Northeast. He supported the students' club. He supported the West Indies House. He supported the forestry workers when they um, were demobbed. He looked tried to get them other jobs in the RAF, etc. If they wanted to stay in England. Um, He's also well known as for his work in uh, the Windrush. He is sometimes called the gay father of the Windrush. If you look in the Google Docs, you will see the telegram that was sent to him by a Sierra Leone officer on the Windrush saying, could you please find accommodation for these 300 former soldiers? And it was he who found Clapham Barracks for them. And from there, we have the Caribbean community in that area in Brixton. Um, he later went to work in Ghana. He also got an OBE. So you're looking at, you know, these links are not Newcastle. They're not Black history. They are world history. So he's one of the people in we talk about in the 
student house. This is a nurse from Sierra Leone. And this is interesting because the student house mainly had male students and it mainly had university students. But clearly it had a nurse. We didn't know much about her, but her nephew and niece um, wrote us when they saw her picture on a calendar, telling us a little bit about her history in when she went back to Sierra Leone and how she did a, had a sterling nursing career and then as a matron in a children's hospital. She lived to 85 and was a much loved aunt, a loving and disciplinarian aunt to her very wide network of children. The very last person we'll talk about is Victor Oyenuga. Again, we're looking at local history, black history, world history. He is the first Nigerian to study agriculture uh, in Europe or anywhere. Because, of course, people from West Africa were only allowed to study in Britain. They were not allowed to go anywhere else. And if they did, they couldn't practice in Britain. Um, he had a, a, a disjointed education as a child, as a young person. He came to Britain and he found it difficult and he just studied and studied and studied. He achieved so well that when he returned to Nigeria, um, he became an emeritus professor of Ibida and he got um, doctorates for his amazing contribution to agricultural science in Africa. He got a doctorate from Durham University for the quality of his research. He was outstanding. He still found time to co-found the African Friendship Society from the colonial from the club in 1947 because he met so much racism in the city, in the church, and among the students. And he felt it was up to the Africans to try and tell people what was what, that he was not a monkey and he had not lived in trees. Um He's a very interesting person because as well as doing that, he got married in Newcastle. It was the wedding of the year. His first son was born here and baptized here. His son gave us all this lovely information and pictures. Um, he was an ardent Christian. He was an ardent communist. He represented Nigeria at the Budapest World Conference. And he found there was no racism there or in, in Budapest or in Paris as he had experienced in Britain. Um, a really important person, a really important club that reached out to other areas and to other people, not just for themselves. And then all this information, of course, is also expanded on in the Google Docs, which are at the end of each, each section. So we won't go to... Um, Frederick Douglass, again, you're very welcome to come on a walk or to look at it all on the website. But I just want to return to the PowerPoint briefly before I finish and open it up for questions. Yeah, I should do resume slideshow. And this is the last slide. And in a sense, what I'd like you to do is to go to the website, please, to enjoy all the resources, the walks and their Google Docs, but not just that, but also to comment, to contact us, to subscribe to the mailing list, and to contribute. We need help. We have had Massive help in setting this up, including from Audrey. Um, but we continue to need help. We need your experiences. We need the missing information. We've got a section called Incomplete Narratives. We need help with doing the research. Um, so we do want you to go. We want you to enjoy. We want you to comment. And we want you to contribute. And we want you just to continue on the road you are doing all the good work that you are doing. And that's the end. Thank you very much for your patience in listening. Thank you. Now over to you for questions. Well, thank you very much. That was excellent. 
What's excellent. Yes, very mm. excellent. I I just ask a quick question before Audrey goes. Um, is comparing the hidden history, which mm. some have been quite recent for myself, of the contribution of African people to this country, especially when you said they were not allowed to, um, you know, qualify or work anywhere else. If they trained anywhere else, they weren't allowed to work here. If you were to compare the, couldn't say the quality, the people who were like the front runners to the community now, I mean, we're so much advanced, but those community members, those pioneers, they were well educated. And the way that they made the education system for people like myself that were born here. You know, it's very hard. I mean, I'm 67 now and I'm still trying to get a, a degree, like, you know, because I, I want to, you know, do that in history. So the question is, because we started off having a little discussion about it, is there positive changes? It, like, we, we've gone in a circle, but it's like we're going backwards in a way. You know, that, that you see the spirit that they had, that spirit isn't there now, even though we are more together. What would you say? I think you've put your finger on it. That spirit isn't there now. I think they were fighters. They knew they were in a minority. They knew things weren't on their side. And they fought. Now, I'm sure not all of them fought. I am sure some of them played a game. Um, some, of, some of them got depressed. Some of them would have, you know what I mean, got committed suicide. I am sure not all of them were fighters. But sufficient were fighters to build a community and to make a difference. I think that community feeling has been diluted. And I mean, a lot has been written about why, how people were co-opted onto race relations things, how there was much more intermarriage, you know, how there was a divide and rule about the sort of individualism that makes community difficult. You know how, you know, the kind of each one teach one has been diluted. It's each man for himself. You know, there's been so many reasons. And nobody knows, I suppose, which one is which, for which person. Each one of us, there may be a different reason why we can't be as active as we'd like to be. Or a different reason, so for sometimes it might have been one teacher, one book, one something that kept us being active, you know? So, but I do feel that we have lost something. Mm -hmm. And that is all I can say. Other people may have different views. Thank you very much. You think, do you think it's because they thought that people thought things were getting better? And so they took the eye, their eye off the ball and just, um, you know, do you think yep. that's got something to do with it? Yeah, I think that's a great part of it. We had the race relations acts. You know, we thought, we thought. If you got your back against the wall, then you realise that you either cave in or you fight. Mm -hmm. But if things seem a little bit better, perhaps you don't have that same. But the people need to realise it's just as bad or nearly as bad as it ever was and the fight's still necessary. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree. It is, it is challenging. Vivian's, yes, been, I mean, Vivian's been clapping and doing lots of lovely things. So over to you, Vivian. <laughs> wow. I, I have Oliver Twist's DNA 
Because <laughs> I'm asking for more. <laughs> I'm glad. And, 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 and for Tuitosley, um, Charles Dickens' great grandson was in Jamaica, 1907, as a lawyer when we had our earthquake. Oh boy, the world is very, very large. <laughs> hey. But two comments though, Bev, and to thank you most sincerely. You are so engaging. Oh my heavens. <laughs> you are so engaging. God bless you. Two comments, and I'm partial. When you spoke about Dr. Harold Moody, the three Moody brothers from Jamaica, Dr. Harold Moody, 1882-1947, he studied at King's College, top of the class, but could not get a job again because of complexion. And his brother, when next you visit the National Portrait Gallery, you will see Ronald Moody. It's bronze. He has made it, a sculpture, famous sculpture, to the National Portrait Gallery. But there's another brother who was a medical doctor also in Jamaica. He was Custis of the parish of St. Andrew. And there's a school, Woolmers. He had attended Woolmers in his childhood. And he gave generously land, which is now Woolmers Preparatory School. The second comment has to do with Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. I declare interest. I am descendant of Maroons. We beg to differ and would not cooperate with the Europeans. And we were forced to get our freedom. So I'm descendant of proud Maroons. And you should know there are five Maroon communities in Jamaica. And there is one which for me is a sought after place to visit in St. James called Flagstaff. In the 1790s, it is alleged that a Maroon was caught um, stealing a pig and or he stole the pig and they got an enslaved to flog him. The third Maroon War was going to be declared. And Governor Balcaris said to the leader, oh, it's a misunderstanding. Come down to Montego Bay. And they went on what the Maroons thought was a building near the sea. Little did they know that there is a rum made after a certain, named after a certain vulture in Jamaica. And... My batteries, they, they, they had it. It was served to them. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, we are. The rum was served to them. And they did not know where they were. They were on high seas. Where they were taken to Nova Scotia. Mm. The winter killed half of them. And the remainder sent to Sierra Leone. Mm. And I'm here wondering, could some of those descendants who went to Britain be part of that group? One doesn't know. But it's a beautiful story. It Thank is, you very much. It is a lovely story. So what we're looking at is the Creoles of Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone has such an amazing history because they had all these different groups coming at different times. So they had the Maroons via Nova Scotia, but also they had when the um when Britain decided it was in their interests to stop the trade in enslaved Africans, it was in their interests and to board every other boat and take away the enslaved Africans. And then they thought where to put them, so they put them back in Sierra Leone, wherever they came from. So Sierra Leone has this very mixed community. The poor blacks from Anything London but. was sent to Sierra Leone. Three sixty went, sixty survived. More, you know. So it has this very mixed community. Melting pot. And it's the Creoles, and a lot of these people are Cre who came from Sierra Leone. The sort of, I think, the better off. You know, they went to the grammar schools and whatnot, whatnot. I mean, Fury Bay College was for the elite of West Africa. Um, there are many of the people who came to London, who came to Durham and Newcastle as doctors, were from that Creole group. Thank you. Wow. Very interesting. And I've been helped by people from that group in this research. You know, it has been a, a collective effort. 
So but, I have but, many but, but to sorry, that. Bev. This, this, this. I am so, I'm so grateful for these presentations. I cannot find words. And yesterday, I spoke about the lady who gave the man the, the gift, and the man told the wife that he couldn't find words to thank her for the lovely birthday gift. So the following year, she gave to him a dictionary. So <laughs> <laughs> I, nice. I don't want to have a dictionary. Right. But since some Europeans, in order to justify enslavement, they said that people of African descent were directly, were half animal and half human. I thought that by this, we would have got over that, but we are not getting over it. There is the racism still going on. Some Europeans, I hasten to say, because people, people like Sir Thomas Powell Box and Granville Sharp, they rejected that. Mm -hmm. and, and Sir Thomas Powell Box, and God bless his memory, he um, introduced in Jamaica teacher education mm -hmm. through the micro. I benefited from it, mm -hmm. so I am a convert. Mm -hmm. But what, there, there is still that stigma there to justify hurting other people. Mm -hmm. When will it stop? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Remember? Oh, sorry, do. Yes, do sorry. Did, yeah, did Audrey want to say something? I have to go. That's what I wanted to say. I just wanted to thank <laughs> okay. everybody, and especially Beverly. I mean, I know I've got the book. I've got one of the calendars, if not two of them. Mm -hmm. But hearing her talk about it brought it all so much more to alive, more alive. And I really enjoyed it. And I'll be on that website and and publicising it before long. <laughs> so thank you. Great. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Thank you for seeing you all. all. Your <laughs> stay in touch with me. Thank yes. You for your right. Bye -bye. communication. What I was going to say, what I observed, right, Bev, is that um, when I look, when I look at certain history, historical, um, say people of historical, um, in positions, I look and I thought, wow, Mary Seacon, Walter Turn. And the other day I realised when I was reading a bit more into him, Harold Moody, right, who was a doctor in Peckham for, of Jamaican descent, mm -hmm. he was mixed race as well. Mm -hmm. So I noticed they were all mixed race. Mm -hmm. So that brings us back to the Creole. That brings me back to when you mentioned that they, they swapped the Africans for some lighter skin people mm. from another country mm. and I thought I the way that I've always seen Harold Moody because I always write about Harold Moody mm. and from here I knew he had a I did one time I saw another name and then I realized he had a brother who was an artist or architecture and then when Dr Vivian mentioned him as well I looked it up and so there was a race, there was a colour thing. And when Harold Moody's son, so he's quarter race, because his wife was a white lady, mm -hmm. she's a white nurse in his practice. Mm -hmm. When he got to a certain stage in the military, mm -hmm. they wouldn't let him get a top position mm -hmm. because he had a bit of colour in him. Mm -hmm. So they... It's in the books that Howard Moody really was our first black politician because mm. he went into parliament and debated and helped them kind of change the law in a way mm. to allow people of colour to be able to get promotion in the military. Mm. Mm. It, is, it is interesting because, I mean, I... Some of the books, the research I did decades ago, you know, the writing decades ago, was about, um, I called it Black Children with a White Parent. Yes. Because growing up, maybe you'd be the same in, in um, Vivian in Jamaica or in Trinidad, really, you were all Black. Um, you weren't mixed race. We didn't have that term. You could be Dougla, but you were Black. Um. And in a sense, when you think of 
Oh, Bob Marley, anybody you think of. Um, there isn't Frederick Douglass. All of them had a one white parent, but they identified as black. So what is interesting is how, because of our peculiarity in England, I think, we have kind of divided the black constituency into you are black and you are not so black and you are not so black. Right. Well, I'd just like to say, if I can intervene, I was the first black girl of Jamaican born in Northampton. My parents from Jamaica in the 50s were the first Windrush to marry here. And so most of my friends are mixed race. Mm that are my age and older, but their dads were American soldiers or mm -hmm. GIs. And I've got a, a particular friend and her dad was from Mountain View in Jamaica, but her mum was Irish. Mm -hmm. And they both passed now, but I knew her dad very well because he was a, he became a friend of my mum's, you know. Um, he was first in, but she, Barbara, so I've done a presentation and we were there, you know, that exhibition of all the black people in the forces. And um, Barbara would not have it any other way because she grew up in the, in the 50s and she was referred to in Northampton as half caste, mm -hmm. half caste Barbara. Mm -hmm. Then we had white Barbara. We had black Barbara, we had housewife Barbara. So we had so many Barbaras. So when they brought in to be pol um, politically correct, mm. that you've got to say dual nationality or mixed mm. heritage, she she swore at them and said, look, I'm a pensioner now. I'm not going to change <laughs> my name. <laughs> you with me? Mm. So um, it, I suppose it depends on the socialization mm. that you grow I mean, I was I was on BBC Look East when it was when we were at 17. That's time I ever given an interview. I used to pray, add to my prayers when I was a little girl, oh God, please let me be white in the morning. It's because it was only my brother that I saw that looked like me. And when I go to school, they had these Robinson Gully Wag on. So that's all I knew. I was a gully wag, I was a wag, I was a blackie, mm -hmm. and then my brother. But you see, when I was six, my mum came back to Jamaica where her dad sent for her, and I lived in Jamaica for 18 months, and that changed my life. Because mm -hmm. when the ship pulled in the arbor and I saw some children look like me, I realised nothing was wrong, I do belong. See, that year and a half, when I come back, I, I was a different person, I was much brighter than my average age group. They thought the milk come out the bottle, what we used to have at school. I used to have to milk the cow before I went to school and I had to walk three miles in the country. Yeah, so it depends on your socialisation. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that little bit I had in Jamaica because coming back here, if I hadn't gone to Jamaica, I wouldn't be sitting on this platform now and knowing great people like yourself and Dr Vivian. Thank you. It is real, real important. And I mean, I'm doing a talk on the 25th of this month. I haven't quite prepared it about why it's so difficult getting homegrown students of, I think they might call it ethnic minority or something, um, that it's, you can, they can get at the universities overseas students of every shade, but to get the people from Britain is challenging for the university, right? And you have to think, growing up in Britain, isolated, what that has done to people. And it isn't that we are victims. It isn't that we are defective. It isn't that we are deficient. It is what it has done to people growing up isolated in a racist society. 
and that is a a hard thing. The universities can't overcome it by trying to be nice one day and not nice the next day. <laughs> you know, it's something we don't grapple with really. How difficult it is that isolation. I'm not saying everything in the Caribbean or in Africa is hunky dory at all. But I'd not, just like not add, being isolated yeah, matters. Yeah, I just wanted to add two things. I mentioned that the other day. I think it was yesterday or the day before. My mother came here 54. She was about 22. And she came from a family of 10 children in Kingston. And she was the only one that came to England. She didn't have no brother. She still never had when she died, right? So I happened to get, I was christened and baptised or confirmed in mm. the same church that she was married in. Mm. And I got a, a spiritual revelation when I went up in the altar and I thought, gosh, it's the same old Saxon church, Norman church. What it must have been like when the Windrush people came here and some of them, did, they came to the brother or the sister or uh, auntie and that was bad enough. And if you never had anyone, it was really bad. So that adds on to when they have children and then the children like me grow up, you know, um, when the Windrush people sent for their children, my brother who passed now, Sadly, he was murdered, but he, he used to come home and he said, Mummy, I've got a new friend. Because they, they built a school in Northampton and mostly black children from abroad that they put there. And my mum was trying to say to him, just because they're black, Edward, that doesn't mean they're your friends. You see, he was hungry. He was hungry for companion. So when you put, the, put it together, my mum... I'm a little bit like her. She's a very kind and gentle lady, but I've got a bit of my dad. I don't put up with no foolishness. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Um, also, what, what happens? You, black people have to suck their, is it suck salt? Mm. Bite their tongue? Mm. Over, and I don't know how they overcome all these things because they know what was wrong, but they didn't say anything because they needed their job. Mm -hmm. They're sending money to, abroad to their mum or their dad and their mm -hmm. auntie for their children. They've got to bring their children back. They've got to hold on to the job, play for the room, hopefully drop a partner to get somewhere to live so that when their children come over. So that that era there made a more isolation for both because mm -hmm. they kept, not deliberately, some didn't, but a lot of them had their eye off the ball with their children's education. Mm. And that suffered as well. But I mean, my mum didn't have her eye off the ball. She didn't drive. And sometimes they would have two parents day the same evening. And so she, she was running from one school to the other, you know? So one socialization is very effective. Mm. You it's, see, I also very... think that they didn't, I mean, one, they couldn't say much, as you say, because of their circumstances, yeah. but also they didn't quite understand their children's position because they exactly. had not grown up in isolation. Exactly. Their formative yes. years were in a black community. Yes. So they could my not understand. Yeah, my mom grew up in the church. She was an organist for her church. Um. I went back to Kingston and went to her church and they thought it was my mum reincarnating. <laughs> but what, what it is, that socialisation, my mum used to say to me sometimes, you're too militant, mm. you know, because I had to stand up for my rights, mm. you know, and that's maybe why I'm where I am now. Not, And I found that there's a nice lady, she's been on this platform and she's from Jamaica but she's been here about 10 years and she's a, she's a tutor. She's a doctor. Uh, 
um, at doctorate at the university. She's a Jamaican. And, you know, sometimes I know that she's sucking salt. But when you're in a position in an institution which is not representative of yourself, sometimes you want, like I, I talk out and she said, but when you go on to Elizabeth, what will happen to us that the left ear? Because we see what's right, but you know, they're, they're still a cleach. Is it a clink? A cleat? Cleach? They're still, mm. yeah, there's a clink. You know, that you're not in that inner circle. Yeah, you know, not it's in not that. worth saying anything sometimes because they will stunt your, because she should have had a professorship long time. Mm, mm. I just it, leave it there. It's a challenge. <laughs> I know Roland is very quiet. Roland, you're there. Maybe he's not there. <laughs> I just don't want him to feel he can't contribute. I'm here very much so. I'm here. I'm, here. I'm oh. listening. I'm working at the same time. Yes, That's I okay. I just didn't want you to feel you couldn't contribute. No, I've got something to contribute. But um, what time are we finishing today? Soon as we're ready. Okay, I've got something to contribute because well, I'm organizing an event. But well, anyway, then. yeah. Excuse me, well, then. You know, I know mm -hmm. you've got something to contribute. Would you be able to mention when you went to Canada and you yeah. met those Maroons in Canada recently? Yes, I can. In fact, can I do that now or uh, in five minutes? Yes. When, would you, when would you like me to do that? Now. No. <laughs> no, okay. Right, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. I uh, was out in Canada um, in from mid-July, from about the 14th of July to early August. I was out there. The Maroon community out there in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which are the Maroons that left Jamaica, I think, don't quote me on this, please, around about mm -hmm. the mid-17th century, century. On the way to Sierra Leone, some of them stopped off in Nova, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and they built the city, Dill, which is like this hill on the top of Halifax. And many of the roads in Halifax they built, so they were like very much at the beginning of the establishment of the city of Halifax. But what I was involved in, and they build a community called Africville. From about the early 40s, they experienced a lot of hostility from the Canadian government trying to force them off the land of Africville, which is a community of about, thinking about, on about 100 families that were there. Um, but from the early 40s, they experienced a lot of hostility from the Canadian government. There was an infectious disease hospital that was placed next to the community. In addition to that, there, I think there was a prison there as well that was placed next to them and the rubbish dump as well. So there was the, and also there was not many services that they had, no bus services, water, and I think and they had challenges getting electricity as well. In about the 60s, they were physically forced off the land. A number of houses were bulldozed. Um, and they were, they were forced off the land. And the port was built there. That port, container port, and the military dockyard, which is used to service and repair as well as things built as well some of Canada's, Canada's battleships. Um, billions is made per, per annum from the port. There's a toll bridge there as well, and there was some sort of, of an agreement that the community would benefit from the toll bridge and benefit would have been would benefit from the port as well, because the port was built on their land. Land was taken from them, stolen from them, and in many cases they were tricked. While I was there, I hosted an event with that community um, and the event was called Africville to Windrush because 
uh, but on about the same time when the Windrush generation were experiencing their hostility, because the hostility towards the Windrush generation started from day one, from the 21st of June, so to speak, when they were not allowed to disembark. So that event was hosted there. And what myself and others, they were trying to do is for them to sort of lobby the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Secretariat, because with Canada being a part of the Commonwealth, to say Canada, in many cases, you would criticize countries like Qatar, Dubai, etc., um, Saudi Arabia, etc., about the human rights record. But here you are, mm. you are taking these people off the land, force them off the land, and disregarding them to a great extent. And hopefully, at some point, they would go back, can go back to the United Nations and have their cause highlighted at the United Nations because I was at the United Nations a few weeks ago at Geneva representing, so to speak, for Windrush. I was there at Global African Congress. Also, Priscilla Robinson was there as well. We raised a number of points. And what we had a response from the Home Office representative at the United Nations, and that response was misleading because Home Office said, in response to questions that was asked about legal representation, that there has been changes recently to the legal aid rules where the Windrush applicants would not be disadvantaged. Myself and Priscilla checked and we could find no such changes on the legal aid website. So that was that that was what I was doing out in Canada and I hope to follow up on that. I know I've given you a quick synopsis. I've not gone into a lot of the intricacies of the details. So mm -hmm. sort of summarize somewhat. If you have any questions you have or you would like me to elaborate, then I'm here, I'm listening. In addition to that, before I go, while I know there's the delegation going to Jamaica, I'm working on something in the background, hopefully, to have a Windrush presentation. Try, I'm working on the venue at the moment, literally as I speak. I'm trying to get in touch um, with a venue in Jamaica. Any assistance will be appreciated as well. I'm trying to get a location downtown. I'm thinking what theaters at the moment are possibly a church. Also, I've made contact and working on that with a church out in Yalas in St. Thomas. It's still early days, but I'm getting some good feedback at the moment. So hopefully over the next couple of days, then we can, we'll have a Windrush an, um, event organizer there. And what I'm thinking at the moment is to have the home office zoom in and do a presentation. But as I said, it's early days, give me a couple of days and then mm -hmm. I suppose to I hopefully can come back to you with some sort of structure as to how that right. will work. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's very, thank very you. Early, yes, yeah? Lovely. Roland, it's been wonderful because you've picked up on what Vivian spoke about, about the Maroons moving from, you're not moving, being forced from Jamaica yeah. to Nova Scotia. So it's very, it's you know, it's wonderful that in a sense we're getting a little bit more information on exactly mm -hmm. the same topic. Yeah, that's why I asked him to yes. um, oh, come in. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. So that was... I'm still in touch with them. So hopefully, hopefully, um, if we could, I think that if we could have them, one of them do a, one of the representatives mm. there do a presentation here um on one of the on one on the platform at some point then. I think that would be good, but that's a discussion for Liz. It is, and it is. Julie Elizabeth to have. Yeah. yeah. It would so be very well. Yeah. yeah. Vivian, did you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say that with regard to what um Ron wanted today, a space. How many persons would you want to be accommodated? It's all uh, uh um Julie Elizabeth will understand this uh, more, probably more than you, but I'm gonna give you a bit of preamble. Um we try to be as adaptive and dynamic and as flexible as possible when we put on these events. So at this stage, in terms of numbers, I do not know. As we go along, I'm thinking at the moment, 60 to 100, 
possibly okay. more. I'm thinking the Ward Theatre. I know there are a number of venues downtown <laughs> Kingston. Oh, boy. Right? So, what I want to suggest, yeah. I don't know if the Ward Theatre mm -hmm. is in a state. No, I don't know what's mm -hmm. going on there. But I hasten to tell you that mm -hmm. the National Library of Jamaica could accommodate you downstairs mm -hmm. there. And also the African mm -hmm. Caribbean Institute of Jamaica that's near to the National Gallery at the bottom of Orange Street. Yeah. There's lovely parking space yeah. there. And um, mm -hmm. the contact is uh, Dr. Henry. I'm doing a presentation there on the 24th of yeah. October about Dr. the Honorable Olive Lewin. So um, yeah. you can link with me about space outside of this meeting. That would very much be appreciated. <laughs> Let me give you a synopsis of what I'm thinking. Outside at the moment. of this meeting. Outside yeah. of the meeting, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Outside sure. of the meeting. Okay, I'll talk yeah, to, yeah, Roland, to you. Link yeah? me in and I'll help to get the get, get it together as well, you know? Most definitely. You're on board with that, June Elizabeth, and hopefully you'll be mm -hmm. part of a presentation that is like, needless to say, Garrick and others as well. But, right, so, okay. But, so, we'll come back uh, to Bev now. We'll thank come you very much. Yes. To, we, right. we'll, yes. we'll thank, develop thanks thanks for that, thank Roland. It's just important that we hear from everybody and it is wonderful to have the link with the Maroons. I think I think I think we could finish about no, what do people think? Well what we could do, which you could just go around and everybody say the last word, but you have the last word. Yes. Okay. As I'll a, be quiet. You all yeah. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um Dr. Vivian Crawford, would you like to say <laughs> you should uh, not ask you should not ask me <laughs> because as I said and I still hold on to it, I am Oliver. I am asking for more. <laughs> God bless. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Is there anybody else that wanted to say something? Let's have a look at the um um I think it's you, June Elizabeth. <laughs> it's only me here, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I just want to thank you, Beverly, for that magnificent presentation. And as Dr. Vivian said, he wants some more. I'm going to look up some more now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's triggered me, you know. I, I wasn't aware of, I knew there was a lot of African students in England because my husband who's 86 he came here in 55 and lived in London and he was amongst a lot of African mm. students and they exchanged notes mm. and he, they told him that when they were at school they were taught the English way that the, the, the Caribbean people were cane rats lazy because they hide in the cane field and, and eat the cane and don't do no work. And my husband was saying that they had books that said somebody, the jungle boy, the African. So they were really playing each other off each other negatively. So mm -hmm. when I hear the presentation today, I wasn't surprised there were so many scholars, but I was so pleased to know that there were so many and you know i really appreciated every word of your presentation thank you very much lovely thank you thank you it is a pleasure to be here and thank you for such positive responses and who knows not this maybe next year year after i'll come and give you some more <laughs> lovely thank but you thanks. very much so let's give you a hand up <laughs> right. clap lovely. okay Thank you very much right, indeed. So I will end now. Is that okay, everybody? Yeah, you can do so. Yeah. Right. So God bless everybody with all the hard work you're doing, all the busyness, all the, you know, the way forward you're doing, despite the hassles. God bless everybody. Okay. Till next time. Take, Take care now. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.